I'm glad that this Sunday finds you all well. I have a, a great deal of anticipation for what God's going to do uh, in our midst today. But um, let's look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. As you're turning there, you may have noticed we do have communion kind of like the, the way that we had done it all along, but I do understand there may be some of you with apprehension, so we do have the pre-packaged ones in the back um, where the e-give station is, so if you, if you uh, don't quite feel comfortable yet coming up and being served by us, you are more than welcome um, when we do uh, have our time of communion to, to swing in the back and just grab that so you can still partake with us and not feel like you're missing out on anything. Amen? And it's worth noting that, that this is juice. It's unleaded, okay? <laughs> Inevitably, every time we do it, someone says, you know, or asks. Um, Matthew 7, we're going to look at verses 24 through 28. And we're in this, um, these verses, we're going to be looking at intentional doers, uh, firm foundation, which I'm so gracious um, to say that uh, Good Neighbor Homes provided all this incredible equipment as an illustration to having a firm foundation. Amen. So after this, we're going to have a construction project as a church. <laughs> Hope you know how to run a saw. All right. Um, verse 24, we're going to begin. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this word uh, that I believe to be in season. And so I pray that you would keep your people's hearts open to receive the word, even if it's confrontational, even if it's convicting, even if it reaches into their lives and makes them just a little bit uncomfortable, that they would still be open to receive the word of the Lord and allow the seeds that are sown to fall on fertile soil, that they may spring forth and bear fruit a hundredfold. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Um, before we dive into this text, I, I want to say I have such a heart of anticipation, um, not just for the preached word today, uh, but all the things that God is doing in our midst. Can I glorify God for a moment? Can I give glory to God in the midst of God's people? First of all, I hope you made note of it. Write it down, set a reminder, one service, 10 a.m. next weekend, and that is because we are baptizing over 20 people. Come on. Over 20 people have confirmed. It, it, like Pastor Jess said, it's not too late. So if you're like sitting there and you're like on the fence, I, you need to get off the fence and into the waters of baptism. Amen. That's one thing. I got So we figured, why divide the body? Let's all celebrate together. So we're going to pack this place out. We'll have chairs upon chairs upon chairs. Um, and secondly, last night we had our worship night, which is always so powerful. And um, what had happened was earlier in the week, uh, Aaron does group training. That's my wife, for those of you that don't know. Um, she does group training at the gym. Middle of the week, she tweaked her back. Doing one of the movements, just, you know, she goes into beast mode. She locks in. And uh, she was got, went a little too heavy. So she tweaked something in her back. And like throughout the week, you know, I tried massaging it out. She tried to foam roll it out and nothing's working. And during the worship night, I see she's holding Isabel. Isabel's like wrapped around in like koala bear status. And I see like two thirds of the way through, we're singing, show us your glory. Show us your glory. And I'm watching my wife do like these. And I'm, I'm like. Is she getting caught up in the Holy Ghost? Like, I get ready to, like, catch her. You know, I got the blanket to put over her. Um, but she, she <laughs> it's old school for those of you that don't know that. Somebody goes down in the spirit, you just got to have a blanket ready. doesn't matter. Throw it on them. Um, so she's doing this weird, like, movement. And she turns to me and she says, David, I felt like a warmth come upon my back. Because she prayed, She like, we're singing, and she prayed the simple prayer of like, God, I know you care about my back. 
It's hurting me. My daughter's clinging to me. It's making it worse. God, please heal my back. And she said she felt a warm wave go upon her back. And immediately she goes, I couldn't find where it was tweaked. And that's why she was doing those movements. She was trying to find where it was hurt and she couldn't find it because God healed her. Hallelujah! That's my Jesus. And so I'm excited because we've got like this, I believe salvation is still the greatest miracle that ever could be. He says, don't rejoice that you do all these signs and wonders. Rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That is still, but I, it's good to know that God still heals too, huh? He still heals the soul and he still heals the body. That's my Jesus. Can we give him a hand? Come on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I will glorify your name in the midst of your people, oh God. So, backstory. Let's get to the text. Backstory um, to where this came from. We're in Florida, and we would try to build something of value um, when we would go to the beach. And we would build, you know, whatever we could build. We had all these little beach toys and stuff. So we'd build these sand castles, and we'd build these, you know, elaborate things. We'd build a turtle one day, and, you know, tried to build a, a crocodile another day. But inevitably, what would happen is the tide would come in, and what we built would be washed away. Because the substance of what we were building upon could not be upheld by the foundation that was under it, namely sand. And so, it, it immediately the Lord brought that scripture to mind and I began to meditate on these verses for several days about what we're building our lives upon and what we're basing the very heart of our lives and, and that the substance of it and the foundation of it need to match. Um, and so, this was in my heart and, and, and then it caused me to just really build a, a sermon about this and a word from the Lord as he developed it more and more. But I want to say right out of the gate that I, I love and appreciate the Bible um, and Jesus' ability to use um, natural kind of everyday topics that we would know and experience and transmit a deep spiritual truth. Right? Like, he, he takes things um, like a farmer sowing seeds. A fisherman using a net to catch fish. A soldier putting on armor. And here the construction of a building. All these naturally occurring things in our lives that we can relate to. He doesn't give us some outer worldly thing we don't understand where we're trying to grasp at straws to figure out what the Word of God is trying to get across to us. And for somebody who reading comprehension wasn't my strongest point in life. It's helpful to have simple truths transmitted through the Word that I understand. And I believe that the bottom line reason why God does this is because He doesn't want us to be deceived. God wants us to get it. He wants us to understand His will, His plan for our lives. He wants us to walk in His best. He doesn't want us to be wondering, like, what in the world does that mean? I know there are some verses that are pretty complex, but the majority of it's like, all right, he gave me a natural illustration. He talks about a guy building a building and what we're going to do here. In the parable we just read, where he gives this naturally occurring a builder, two builders building, is at the conclusion of an incredibly powerful sermon that Jesus preached known as the Sermon on the Mount. That's right. And in this sermon, Jesus lays the groundwork for what it looks like to live for Him. What it looks like to walk out the Christian faith. What it looks like to represent Him in a lost and broken and hurting world. And He addresses a myriad of topics. He, he begins with the Beatitudes, a blessed life, and what a blessed life looks like. And then He goes into all of these sort of moral and ethical topics. Things like anger, lust, divorce, retaliation, oaths and being a person of your word, prayer and fasting, anxiety about temporal things here on earth. He, he talks about all these different things when he's speaking this sermon on the mount, but they all converge. All these things converge into a parable about two builders. And that's what we read today. The, the convergence, the meeting point of all these different ethical and moral and Christian lifestyle topics in a parable about two builders. And I believe the reason for this convergence is because Jesus is looking for doers. 
He's looking for people to put legs to their faith. Um, I, I don't believe it's in a legalistic or obligatory or religious way. I believe it's in a joyful appreciation for who Christ is in our lives and a desire to live for Him, a deep desire that comes from a well of gratitude that we joyfully serve the Lord. And we're not looking at it as a bunch of rules, but it's, I want to joyfully represent my Lord and my Savior out of gratitude. It's the least I could do for all He's done for me. Amen. And there's actually two different instances in this Sermon on the Mount where Jesus addresses doing versus a lack thereof. The first comes in verses 21 through 23 where he confronts talking versus doing. He says, you know, you called me Lord, Lord. You had the verbiage right then, didn't you? you? You had all the Christianese down, but you did what you wanted to do. It's nothing more frustrating than someone who has all the Christian language down, but their life doesn't match. Christianese, I call it. Talk the talk, but don't walk the talk. It's getting all quiet in here. <laughs> it's getting awfully quiet in the house of God. It's okay. This is good. And here, Jesus addresses hearing versus doing. He says, you got to talk the talk, that's great, but let's walk the talk. And then he says, listen, uh, you just heard me preach, essentially, this entire message on what it looks like to represent me, how you can represent me and be different than the world, how the world responds to these different topics, these different moral and ethical topics, and how you should respond to them. And be different than the world, the ecclesia, the church, the called out ones. You've heard everything I've said, now let's put it to use. The bottom line is God desires that we live out what He has spoken. Not just merely hearing. He says, man, I I've shared everything with you. Now let me show you what two different people look like that have heard. And I so appreciate several weeks back, PJ's sermon, he talked about the building blocks. You remember his illustration, the building blocks out of Nehemiah for foundational living, being a doer, and then Alex's uh, strong statement in his sermon. We said, if we're not living this thing out, then we're merely part of a big book club, the Joy Lock Club. <laughs> if we're, <laughs> we're not living this thing out, then we're just part of a big book club. That's a harsh reality, man. And 2 Timothy, if you're taking notes, 2 Timothy 2.19 speaks to this part of a firm foundation in Christ. And it's, it's a hard word. He says, a firm foundation in Christ is found in turning away from wickedness. Turning away from the world. And living and representing God. Living and representing Christ. And if you're sitting there, you know, you're wondering, you know, is this parable for me, Pastor? Is this something I really need to hear? Because I found myself at times, you ever sit in a service and you're like, boy, I just wish so-and-so was here. If they were here, buddy, God smack them upside the head, set them straight. They need to hear this. But right out of the first few words Jesus said, he says, everyone then who hears. So the question is answered, yes, it's for you. It's a timeless universal broadcast for everyone who hears, reads, looks at, listens to the words of Christ. And the reason why is because we're all building something. Whether you want to think you are or you're not, you're building something with your life. Whether you're doing no nothing, doing something, you're building with your life. And, you know, in fact, every area of what kind of like represents the human life in one way or another, one context or another in the Bible is, is looked at in a structural way. Us, per whoops, us personally. <laughs> in case you were falling asleep. <laughs> Our lives, us personally, we're, we're called the temple of God. This building being built up in faith. If you're married and have a family, it was called the household of. The household of Jesse. The household of David. A building, a structure being built up. What about the church? This body of Christ is known as the house of God or the household of faith. 
in every arena of life, personally, from in our families, in our faith, we're building something. And the foundation upon which we build is of the utmost importance. As we're seeing, and we're going to uncover more now, I'm no expert when it comes to a natural foundation. I don't know the first thing really about construction. I do projects and then I pay people to fix what I did. <laughs> but I know somebody who is an expert. Can we get the handheld ready, please? I want to ask uh, Bob from Good Neighbor Homes to come up and share with you from a, a, a natural sense why a foundation is so important when it comes to a structure. Which, by the way, can we give them Good Neighbor Homes, Bob, his family, a hand? They built this for our drummer so that your ears don't explode. So are you going to pay me for this just like you pay for So There's your a nominal fee. Okay. Checks in heaven's mail. <laughs> Good morning. Well, where to begin? I usually, my, I used to work with my dad in construction, and he used to always start a job by saying this. There's never enough time to do it right, but there's always enough time to do it over. You agree with that? <laughs> and so when you start a job, you always want to start it right and, and do all the right things. Most architects would agree that um, the most important, important part of building a house, it's not the roof, it's not the siding, it's not the cabinets, it's not the windows, it's not the floor, and all the places that we live in, and it's usually on the first page of a plan, but it's the foundation. Because everything after the foundation is predicated on what you did first. Most of our homes, you know, most of us have remodeled our homes or put a new roof on at one time. Maybe the windows started to leak, so you replaced your windows. The floors started to get a little worn, so you refinished the floors. But how many people remodeled their foundation? Probably none of you, because the foundation, when it's done right, takes the test of time. It lasts forever. Up where I live in the in George Washington Park, there are a lot of old foundations with the stones and all the stones. There's no more building there, and all the wood is all rotted away, but there's a, lot, there's a hole in the ground with a lot of stones there. And um, now we have concrete foundations that last forever. Back in, I'll say six years ago, there was a hurricane that was coming up the coast and uh, was going to hit smack dead in Connecticut. And uh, right before that time, we were building a house there, and we did modular homes. And so... Uh, we were in a hurricane area, and those of you that are in the building industry, you know that now there's all these uh, straps that you have to put in, and uh, anchors, and all that kind of thing, and uh, we did that in that house. And we um, took these uh, Simpson straps, they call them, and mounted the walls, or connected the walls directly into the concrete with these straps. Then the roof systems, we strapped with Simpson tie-downs, to the walls, and uh, so the, all the components were all tethered to that foundation. And so after that hurricane hit, and there were some small tornadoes, 10 houses were, com were affected um, in a major way, and um, nine of them actually blew over, except for that house, that all those components of the house were tethered to that foundation. So even though you have uh, a good foundation, if you don't, tether all the pots to that, they'll all blow away. And so just like in our life, you know, when you're building a house, it's probably the, the, the biggest expense that you'll ever have. And you want that done right. Good Neighbor Homes does do that, by the way. <laughs> a little commercial. <laughs> uh, and uh, same way in our spiritual lives. You know, if I was witnessing to someone, and, 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 you know, you, and many of you have witnessed to someone at some point or another, but it starts getting into a debate more than sharing conversation. I always say to them this, eternity, eternal life got, has got to be the most important thing on your mind. The condition of your soul, and, and I would think that you would do all that you can to determine that path. Why would you debate that instead of looking into it to find out if that was the right way to go? 
And so when we hear the scriptures and the, and, and, and the preaching, um, he, we need to lay a foundation so that when the storms come, we can be anchored to that. Do you know the, <clears throat> the statistic about divorce is that one of the main reasons why people get divorced is because of finances. Every area of our life we need to lay a foundation. And you know, as a, Patty was talking about finances, I was thinking of that. When I first got married, when you get married, you have all these expectations. I have my expectations. Ava had hers. And they weren't always the same. And finances was one of them. And so we laid a foundation for finances. And it wasn't complicated. It was this simple. We came into an agreement that we would not argue about finances anymore because we had the same goal to pay all our bills every month. So why are we arguing about that? Because we didn't have enough money to do that. No, we came into an agreement and that was the first brick that we laid for that foundation about finances that we would not argue, but we would pray. And um, well, she stayed with me for 48 years so far. <laughs> So with that, uh, lay a foundation. Bob, man, I, and it's the fact that you, and it, it, I didn't, uh, you know, I just gave him like the premise. I said, I, I need you to give a natural illustration of what we're talking about supernaturally. You know, it's basically what Jesus did. And the fact that he talked about everything being tethered to that foundation, because we're going to go deeper into that. Um, because at first glance, both buildings that were built look structurally sound. They looked like they could weather anything, just like those homes that you talked about when the hurricane came through. Everything looked structurally sound, but one was tethered to a foundation in Christ and one was built on sand. And it, it was the arrival of the storm that revealed which foundation was firm and which had been compromised. It reminds me of um, my annual frustration. Stacking wood. I have a wood-burning stove so I don't pay my child's college tuition in oil. <laughs> Amen. Um, and so inevitably every year we cut, we split, we stack wood and we try our best to create a firm foundation. We get pallets and we lay them out and it looks sound, it looks good, but not all the ground is even along the way because there's a lot of wood. You know, we usually do at least four cords and we cut, split, and stack. And we'll get it all stacked up. It looks pretty good. We'll cover it with a tarp. That's a wrap. And then, you know it, living here in New England, we get some crazy storms. Crazy storm will come, it'll be like, you know, 65 mile an hour winds, whatever, I'll wake up the next morning, and one part of that pile has collapsed. And there it is, I gotta restack it, gotta redo it, and it's all based on, it looked good, but the foundation was not ready for the storm. What I had built upon was not prepared for the storm that would come. And it's very important to note that there were agents of harm and destruction that came against both houses. It's implied in the text that a storm should be expected. It's not a matter of if, but when. It's like the old adage, uh, maybe you've heard it, you're either coming out of a storm, headed into a storm, or you're in the middle of one. John 16.33, if you're taking notes. John 16.33, Jesus said, look, you're going to have trouble in this world. You're, you're, you're going to get you're going to get some trouble. You, you, in other words, you, you don't have to go looking for storms. They're going to find you. They'll hunt you down. Don't worry about it. And when these storms arrive, when it will reveal what your foundation is made of. Um, and what happens is what I found is when the storms come, if the foundation and everything is not tethered to Christ. The rock, and cracks begin to appear. You ever been in a house where cracks begin to appear because the foundation is settling? The foundation might be even a little compromised, and cracks begin to appear. So, what happens is 
And I believe this was a progression because Jesus said it was the rain, then the flood, then the wind. And I believe what happened was the rain came and a crack began to appear. Then the flood came and another crack began to appear. And then the wind came and that was the knockout blow. And so what happens is storms compound with storms. And I've heard people say, well, I have this problem, I have that problem, you know. And maybe it's not that you have an anger problem or a lust problem or a relationship problem or a revenge problem. Maybe the issue is that you have a foundation problem. And we got to revisit what's tethered to the foundation of Christ and what's tethered to the sand of this world. Because you can't have one foot on the rock and one foot on the sand, you're going to be in big trouble. And eventually those cracks will begin to appear. And so you spend your life, instead of retethering to the rock of Christ and getting your foundation right, you start trying to cover up the cracks. Uh-oh, come on, somebody. Something begins to appear. Let me cover that up. Oh, let me cover that up. Now you get your plastic look going on. Pretty soon you look like Church Street in wintertime. You ever driven on Church Street in wintertime in center of Pasco? More potholes than they know what to do with, and they try to cover them up, but they can't cover them up because it's too late. It's ruined. Church Street is ruined. <laughs> but this parable, it brings us to a place of decision. It's confrontational. This parable, it's confrontational because these builders had several similarities, but then they come to a place where they're no longer similar anymore. They have the similarity of they both heard God's Word. Both builders heard God's Word. They both desired to build something of value. They both wanted to build a house. They wanted to build something valuable. They both experienced a storm. But then this is where the Bible separates them. A wise and a foolish builder. You got to take note of this. The wise builder had the ability to apply spiritual truths to life's realities and decisions. It's more than information, hear me. It's application. It's application. Wisdom is knowledge applied. It's understanding what Jesus has spoken into your life and applying it to your life. It's understanding what the Word of God is teaching you and what I'm preaching you, what the life groups are showing you and all these different things that the church represents and what you're doing in your personal devotional life and then applying it to your life. And it's hard for me to fathom that there was a, a wise builder who heard God's word and made wise decisions and that there could be somebody labeled by God as foolish because they did not take what Jesus said and put it into action. That's hard for me to fathom that they could hear the very words of God and go, nah, I know better. I know a better way than you, God. But if we're being honest, if I'm being honest, that's happened from time to time, hasn't it? But you know what God has said, but you say, I might know a better way. It's like the fool. He heard, he knew, but he did not apply. And I like the fact that Jesus' parable is not based on the number of degrees you have. It's not based on the assets you have, the friends you have, your upbringing or background. No, that's all off the table. It's you being accountable to what you know to be true in the Word of God. Being accountable to what you know God has spoken in your life. Now we're going to have communion in just a few moments. And this communion is a remembrance Right? That's what communion represents. It's a remembrance. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And what we're remembering is not merely what Jesus did, but who he is to you and I. And it takes me back to a conversation Jesus had with Peter. He says, who do they say that I am? Who do the crowd say that I am? This I'm talking about voices in your life. People that you maybe love and respect. Maybe even have spoken into your life from time to time. But they oppose the truth of God's word. Who do they say that I am? Prophet. Moral guy. Good teacher. But hear me. Inevitably inevitably the question will go from the crowds from the people around you 
maybe even the person sitting beside you, and God's holy gaze will fall upon you. And just like Peter, he's going to want to know, who do you say I am? Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say I am? And we are individually responsible for the answer to that question, just like we are individually responsible for what we are building with our lives. The builders in the parable stood alone. They couldn't point the finger at anybody but themselves for what they built upon, whether it was a firm foundation on the rock or the sand that wouldn't last. And in a similar fashion, you and I will stand alone before God and we will give an account for what we built with our lives. It's a place of decision today. Because when Jesus asks you, when He comes to you, my prayer is that before your lips answer, your life answers. And if your life doesn't answer, appropriately, maybe today's the day for you to say, I need to get tethered to the foundation again. I've got, this, I've got this crack, and I've just been trying to plaster over it, but it's not going away. In fact, it's getting bigger. And I know if I don't tether this thing, man, it's all going to fall. It's all going to collapse. i got to get this. i got to get this right. I've got to answer today. That Jesus, you know what? You were more than a prophet. You more were you were more than a, a moral man, a nice guy, a miracle worker. You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. Because out of that confession, out of that place where you say today, I know that I know that that initial confession that you are the Christ, you are the Son of the Living God. There is no other way to heaven. Acts four twelve. There is but one name under heaven that has been named by which we are saved, and that is Jesus. When you know that you know that is your answer and that is your rock foundation that you stand upon. That's your starting point. Jesus said, I will build upon this rock. And hear me, not even the gates of hell will prevail against that. You know what that tells me? When you are standing firm first and foremost on your faith in Christ, on the fact that you know that you know who He is in your life, there's a question mark. You know you are my Savior, my Lord. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that whatever storm comes your way, will lose. You will be found standing in the power of God. And so if you're, and, oh, I feel, I got to declare this over somebody. This isn't in my notes as I didn't even come up with this, but till right now, Holy Spirit, thank you. Somebody right now, you're in the middle of a storm and I'm here to tell you, because you are standing firm on the rock, because you are standing firm in your faith, you will be found standing victorious when this storm passes and it will pass. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you at this moment, just bow your heads and close your eyes. I want this to be an intimate, personal moment. Because even Paul said it. He said, let us examine our hearts before the Lord when receiving communion. And maybe this is a point of recommitment. You've drifted or or you've gotten to a place where those tethers have come loose or or you've stopped attending to the foundation and you know it and you need a a place where you say, you know what, this is my place of decision today to get re-tethered to my foundation in Christ. This is where I get things right again. This is where I make the main thing the main thing. I've let the world distract me, life distract me. Or maybe you're sitting here and you know, I need to make that confession of faith. I need to make a confession of faith today and say, I know you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm tired of vacillating between faith and not faith, trusting you, not trusting you, wondering who you are, where you say, you know what? I'm going to put my feet on the rock today. And I love that Luke said it in the same parable. He said he dug deep. He got down through all the muck and all the mire and all the flesh and all the carnality and got to the rock because sometimes that's what you've got to do. You've got to plow through all the nonsense that this world will try to throw at you. You've got to dig deep like Luke said, but when you dig deep, eventually you will find when you dig deep, when you get through all the nonsense and all the lies of the enemy and all the distractions and all the stuff of your flesh that you will find the bedrock of Christ. And upon that you can build. And God 
will be the master architect of your life. And so if you say, Pastor, I either need to retether or I need to make that confession, just slip up your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you, call you out, anything like that. Just slip up your hand quickly right where you're at. Praise God. Many hands, many hands. Before I pray, I just want to make sure, is there one more? You know that this was for you. Thank you. I see that hand. God bless you. Is there one more hand where you say, I need to make that confession. I need to get that tethering. I've got to get my foundation right, and it needs to happen now. I can't wait another day because I don't know when that storm's going to come. I don't know what kind of storm's going to come, and I certainly don't want to be found planted on sand. Is there one more? Amen. I see those hands. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those hands that went up. And I pray that in this moment, before we receive communion, there would be a commitment made in the heart that would translate into reality and decision-making in life. These are the tender moments where your Holy Spirit works so mightily so that no matter what storm comes, even the gates of hell, even every demon in hell trying to come against will be found a loser. And I pray that this commitment today would just be one brick in this new foundation that they're building upon. Before we receive communion with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, continue to do that. If you raised your hand, I want you to have just your own conversation with God. I just prayed over you, but I believe there's something very personal and very intimate about these moments that is between you and the Lord. And maybe you didn't even raise your hand and you just need to have a conversation with God. I'm not talking about you have to shout and yell and make a big scene, but just talk to God like he's literally your best friend and have a conversation from your heart to God. I'm going to give you 30 seconds and then we're going to receive communion. Hey, Pastor Dave here. Just want to say thank you so much for tuning in to our YouTube channel. Uh, make sure if you want to stay up to speed with all the videos that we're going to post in the future, you subscribe to our channel and uh, share it, get the word out to everybody. Lastly, make sure you go to our website. We have our DNA there, everything the church uh, is about here at Glad Tidings Community Church and all the different ministries that we offer. You can go to www.gtcc.church. Again, thanks for tuning in. God bless you.